morning and welcome to our continuing fall seminar series right here at uh, Fletcher Hills Presbyterian Church. This is week number three, and so far we've had a chance to do an overview series of what, what we're doing here, why we're doing this, why it's worth the risk. You heard from many of our elders on that first session as to why uh, we're taking the time to do this and the varying perspectives that those elders held. Last week our guest was Dr. Mark Strauss, and he offered a perspective on the eight prominent verses in Scripture that describe homosexual activity, and he gave what was considered by many a traditional perspective on those verses. Today we have as our guest Dr. Mark Ochtemeyer, who's going to share his perspective on those same eight scripture passages and what many might call a progressive perspective on that, although I'm going to let Mark define what he calls it himself when he gets up here with the microphone. Uh, many of you that were in worship service heard a bit of a bio on Mark. He has been a professor for 15 years at Dubuque Theological Seminary in the area of theology and ethics. He also served as a pastor for a number of years, and he's recently written a book called The Bible's Yes to Same-Sex Marriage. That's how we learned about him, when we were looking for someone to share this perspective. And so uh, we are pleased to have him with us today. Let's give him a warm welcome and give him the rest of the time. Thank you, Kevin. Unlike Pastor Kevin, I'm one of these who's a little altitudinally challenged. So I'm going to, I hope it doesn't seem like too much distance, but I'm going to stand up on the stage so we can see all of you out there. And, uh, sitting in the back. You know, every time I get ready to give one of these talks, I have a feeling the angels are clustered in the corner back here laughing. <laughs> because if you'd have told me 15, 20 years ago that I would be up here today giving a talk like this, advocating the position I am, I'd have told you you were out of your mind. Um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, a bunch of my friends and I led a successful national effort to put constitutional blocks in place that prevented gay and lesbian people from being serving an ordained office in the Presbyterian Church USA. I served on the board of an organization that fought to put those blocks in place and keep them there. I keynoted national conferences designed to rally the troops to uh, not allow gay and lesbian ordination in the church. I co-wrote the Declaration of Faith, which the umbrella organization of all of these groups used to rally the troops to the effort um, to bar gay and lesbians from serving in the ministries of the church. And here I am today speaking to you from a very different perspective. God had some other plans for me. Um, I want to first tell you a couple of things about what did not lead to this change. I am still a self-identified evangelical Christian. I hold a very high view of scriptural authority. I happily affirm the entirety of the Nicene Creed without flinching. I celebrate the Lordship of Christ. Um, and I think the church has to be guided by the Bible. So I am still there. I should also say I am not gay. No members of my family have come out of the closet. Um, you know, it hasn't been any of that that has led to this shift in my perspective. One of the things that really started to arrest my attention on this issue was I started running into devout, conservative, evangelical gay Christians who were struggling with their same-sex orientation and who were trying with all their might to follow the traditional teaching that I and my friends were, were defending and, and pressing in the church. I remember one speaking engagement I had, it was out here on the West Coast, I made it Pasadena, I don't remember what city, but I gave a, that was a talk on church unity or something, I gave that, and afterwards there was this gentleman in the audience who really wanted to talk with me afterward, and so I um, shook everyone's hands and talked, and then he and I met at the, in the corridor in the church where I was speaking, and he was 
you know, I, I think of him as very California. He was tall and blonde and good looking and suntan, you know, had this kind of glow about him. And started learning his story. He was in the top echelons of leadership of an international parachurch ministry whose name you would recognize if I said it, said it out loud. He was in charge of international leadership development for them. And married, you know, beautiful wife, lovely family, successful ministry, had everything going for him. But he told me he had struggled all his life with same-sex attraction. And this had come out. And the evangelicals who worked with him in this parachurch ministry responded, as evangelicals often do, with great love and support and compassion. And they walked with him, and they prayed with and for him. They paid for every therapy imaginable under the sun. They gave him opportunities to publicly repent and recommit himself to his family and his ministry. I mean, they just, everything they possibly could. And I remember about this point in the conversation, um, we were in this hallway, he was leaning back against the wall, and about this, at this point in the conversation, I still get choked up when I think about it, he starts sliding down the wall and winds up in a heap on the floor, weeping, because none of this had worked. He had prayed, he had all this support, and... You know, all he wanted to do was serve God in his ministry. He could not understand why God wouldn't answer these heartfelt prayers for strength and to be have this burden as he saw it lifted from him. And he lost everything, his, his ministry, his career, his family. I remember looking at this man thinking, I just, you know, I don't think I've ever seen this broken a person in my entire life. Um, now this was not an isolated episode. God started putting in my path devout, Bible-believing, evangelical Christians who struggled with same-sex attraction and who prayed and struggled with all their might to get past this, and the results I was seeing in case after case after case were devastating. I mean, I saw deep depression. I saw shattered families. Numbers of these had thought, well, if I just get married to a person of the opposite gender, I'll grow. God will help me grow into that. One friend and student of mine took his own life um, as a result of this struggle, and I saw widespread loss of faith. I mean, people just shatter that their fervent prayers to be given the strength to do this weren't, weren't answered. And this, this really caught my attention because this is not, I mean, these people were trying with all their strength and all their might to be faithful. And this is not what Scripture tells us the outcome of efforts to be faithful will look like. You know, we could cite all kinds of passages, but Psalm 1 is a good one. Those who walk in the ways of the Lord will be like trees planted by streams of water. You know, and their leaves are always green and they flourish no matter what. Well, I was seeing, what I was seeing was the exact opposite of flourishing. I was seeing people spiritually and psychologically just destroyed by these efforts to follow the traditional teaching. Now, this is not to say Jesus doesn't call us to do hard things sometimes, and even to sacrifice our life. But, you know, you read the story of, these, of the early Christian martyrs, and you hear reports of them, you know, marching off to the arenas to face the lions, singing hymns. You know, or Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer facing execution in prison. I mean, he struggled with great suffering and depression, but the prison guard who witnessed him on the morning of his execution um, talked about just the, the radiant sense of God's presence that was there. I mean, that's what scripture says, suffering for the faith 
looks like. And boy, that is not what I was seeing in these cases. I was seeing people shattered, driven away from the faith, completely in despair, and didn't line up with what the scripture said should be the fruits of righteousness. I and mean, that made me start to wonder, well, have I missed something here? Maybe this righteousness I've been teaching, have I been, have I been mistaken about that? Um, now, you know, some people will hear this, this testimony of what kind of set me on a, on a different path and say, oh, well, he's, he's arguing from experience. You know, and experiential theology is not a good thing. And, you know, I'm an evangelical who thinks we found our faith on the Bible. I'm very sympathetic with this critique of experiential theology. Basically, that kind of theology says, well, you know, no, we're not going to... God showed up in Jesus Christ. We have pretty good access to what God is like. That way, that being the case, it would make no sense for us to turn away from what the Bible says and rely on our own experience or feelings or our own gut to, to build up a knowledge of God. You know, we stick with God's revelation in Scripture. But here's the thing. There is a particular kind of experiential theology that Jesus himself commands us to do. Um, Matthew 7, 16. Jesus says, Beware of false teachers. You will know them by their fruit. That is an experiential test for mistaken teaching. And what Jesus says is, if you see a teaching that is producing toxic, devastating fruit in the lives of the people who follow it, that's a good sign that, this is, that there's something mistaken here. You know, so I'm all for not building our understanding of God from our experience, but Jesus says you have to use experience as a negative test for false teaching, and if it proves toxic, go back and check the math. Huh? If, if the fruit coming forth in the lives of the people following this teaching turns out to be destructive, that's a pretty good sign that teaching is, there's something wrong. So, you know, I have running into these situations, it didn't immediately move me to the other side, but it did launch me on this multi-year journey with the scripture, going back to try and figure out where was I mistaken in this traditional teaching I was defending. How could this be wrong? Now, you know, I, again, I was an evangelical with a traditional upbringing. I was familiar with these seven or eight, depending on how you count them, passages in the scripture, and it looked to me like the scriptural case was pretty straightforward. And I was wondering, how could a position with all the support in scripture be mistaken? Well, it turns out that is not a new question in the history of the church. It has been asked almost from the beginning. Um, 177 AD, in the city of Lagundum, in the Roman province of Gaul, the Roman authorities slaughtered the local Christian bishop. And a very brave and very remarkable servant of Christ stepped in to assume the position of leadership. Today we know this person by the name of Irenaeus of Lyon. And so Irenaeus is seeking to care for his flock, and he soon realizes that hostile Roman authorities are the least of his problems. Irenaeus is finding that there are all these counterfeit versions of Christianity floating around the city and confusing his flock. And these, you know, the people teaching these, these false versions of Christianity, I mean, they have, they have a, you know, they talk about Jesus, um, but Jesus is kind of slotted into positions in these arcane, abstruse, philosophical, metaphysical systems. And the teaching really bears almost no resemblance to anything Jesus and the apostles actually taught. But the problem with the false teachers is they are citing scripture by the truckload to support this position. 
And Irenaeus' people, as he's trying to instruct them, are coming to him asking exactly the same question I was asking. How could these physicians, which have so much scriptural support, be wrong, be mistaken? Well, Irenaeus comes up with a really interesting answer to that. He says, imagine that a very skilled artist puts together a beautiful mosaic portrait, you know, made of all these little colored stone pieces. Skilled artist makes a beautiful mosaic portrait of a king. And, you know, that artist gets in financial difficulty and he sells the portrait and another artist gets a hold of the portrait uh, and this guy's kind of a hack. Um, but he wants to put his own stamp on it, so he takes the portrait of the king home and disassembles it. Takes all the, the whole thing apart and arranges the little stones and their colored piles, and he puts it all back together again, except now when you look at it, uh, they've been put back together in such a way that it really, it, what it is is a crude-looking drawing of a dog. And he says, now suppose this hack artist takes his portrait and goes around to all of the different cities showing this thing off, saying, Behold the king! And Irenaeus says, you know, every single stone in that portrait came from the original portrait of the king, but that doesn't make it a picture of the king. And Irenaeus says, this is what the false teachers do with scripture. You know, you have all these little citations drawn from, they all come from the Bible, but they're put together in a way that they don't present a true or a faithful picture. Now that's a little disconcerting. At least for me it was disconcerting. I mean, I want to rely on the Bible for what I believe and teach. And, I mean, if just having a lot of scripture we can cite in support of a position is no guarantee it's either faithful or true. Well, what are we supposed to go on then? How do we, how do we find our, our way? And fortunately, the Christian church over the centuries has come up with lots of different principles and, and guidelines and rules we follow when we interpret scripture that help make sure the portrait we wind up with as we interpret the scriptures is a faithful and true one, a true picture of the king, of Christ. And so I went, you know, I, I knew something was wrong with this traditional teaching. I went looking for what's the right way to understand the scripture, using some of these historic principles to guide our interpretation of scripture. The one that time-tested principle that really helped me get a handle on this comes from John Calvin. Uh, I hope that's a familiar name to you folks, um, aside from just the street out, out here. Um, Calvin, as he's getting ready to lay out his interpretation of the Ten Commandments, um, starts by saying, one thing we have to keep in mind with this, you can't properly interpret biblical law until you understand the purpose of the lawgiver. You can't understand law until you understand the purpose of the lawgiver. Now, this is not something abstruse. This is a common sense principle that we use for making sense of things we hear every day. You know, I, I hear a secondhand report of a remark a friend of mine has made. It just sounds kind of bizarre, and what's my question? Well, what did he mean by that? What was his intention in making that statement? Or judges, when they seek to apply laws, um, will ask about the, about the legislative intent. What was the Congress or the state legislature trying to accomplish, trying to get at when they passed that law? And they used that knowledge of what, what the purpose was behind the law in order to apply it faithfully. So this is what Calvin says we have to do um, as we seek to understand biblical law, biblical teaching. So, okay, coming at this whole issue of, 
of same-sex relationships? What is God's purpose for making love, marriage, and sexuality such important features of human life? You know, I mean, they're a pretty big deal. We spend an awful lot of time obsessing about them. Um, God wouldn't have, you know, God could have had people, I don't know, split off like yeast cells or something, you know. Um, why? What is God trying to accomplish by making this such an important facet of human life? And once we answer that question, then maybe we can start to understand what the whole body of biblical teaching around love, marriage, and sexuality is about, and be equipped to understand that rightly. Well, so I went looking for this, and here is one area where I'm going to have to say we haven't got time to tease out the whole biblical case right here, so you want to see the details, I've written a little book, and the, and the church can tell you about that, but executive summary. As I looked at the whole witness of Scripture, it became very clear that God really, really wants to make all of us like Jesus. God wants all of us to grow in Christ-like love. Well, what does that love look like? I mean, look at the cross. Jesus gives himself completely for us. His love leads to a complete gift of myself. What do we say in our communion services? This is my body given for you. I mean, and that's a bodily gift, too, right? So what is God about with love and marriage and sexuality? Well, that is a very, it's not the only way it happens, but it, love, marriage, and sexuality are very, very powerful instruments God gives us for teaching us how to give ourselves completely to another human being in every facet of our being, our life, our devotion, our promise, our commitment, our bodies, corresponding to Christ's whole gift of himself for us on the cross. Now, I should say, this conclusion of what God is up to, God's purpose for marriage and sexuality, is not unique to me. Um, you read Pope John Paul II's Theology of the Body, you find the same thing coming forward from the orthodox side of the Christian tradition. You can read Paul of Docimo, the Sacrament of Love, and he comes to, the, comes to a similar conclusion. So this is pretty mainstream stuff. This is not something I just cooked up out of nowhere. So God wants us to learn how to give ourselves completely to another human being. That's God's central preoccupation in marriage to make us Christ-like. Well, it was really interesting. A couple of things immediately jumped out at me once I realized that. First, knowing that starts to make sense of the whole body of the Bible and the Christian tradition's teaching on sexuality. You know, why is polygamy frowned on? in the Christian tradition. I mean, if you just do a surface reading of the Bible, it's kind of hard to come up with a biblical case against polygamy because you have all these Old Testament kings who have bunches and bunches of wives in train, and the Bible kind of, you know, shrugs, goes past it and doesn't say anything. But once you realize God's trying to teach us to give ourselves away completely, well, I can't do that if I'm giving part of myself to this person and part of myself to this spouse and part of myself to this spouse. You know, this insight helps us recognize why polygamy is bad news. Why is adultery a bad thing? Well, the same thing, right? I'm married to this person. I've got these commitments. But, you know, I'm also I'm giving this other part of myself to this person over here. Now, we spend a long time going through all kinds of cases, but... You know, suddenly this whole, but just like Calvin says, once we understand the purpose of the lawgiver, the whole body of Christian teaching um, starts to make sense. The other thing that came jumping out at me was there didn't seem to be any reason just on the face of it why a loving, committed, same-gender marriage 
couldn't help people learn to give themselves completely to another person? In exactly the same way. Whoa. You know, looks like a same-sex relationship has as much ability to accomplish God's purposes, to help people grow into this Christ-like image of complete love and self-getting as a heterosexual relationship. Could that be right, I wondered. Now, you know, I, uh, again, I'm an evangelical. You heard about these, in some detail, about these eight passages in the Bible last week that all mention same-sex activity and all seem to look at it pretty negatively, and I am not one who thinks we can just discount or ignore pieces of scripture. I can't do that. I believe in the authority of scripture. So I turned back here saying, okay, you know, what do, we, what do we make of this? All the other teaching seems to fall into this neat, this neat structure that makes sense with this, with this. What about these? Well, one of these other principles that we use to guide our interpretation of scripture to keep us faithful is we read scriptural texts in historical context. And as I went back and started doing some reading and some study on these eight passages, some interesting things came out. There is no word in the biblical languages, in Hebrew or Greek, corresponding to our understanding of homosexuality, of a same-sex orientation. There is no concept of that for the biblical writers. So whenever they're talking about same-sex activity, the only categories they've got to think of it in are, this is out of control lust. There is just not in the biblical world any possibility of a mutual, lifelong, loving, equal commitment between same-gender partners. I mean, that possibility just doesn't exist in the world of the biblical writers. So when they are talking about same-gender activity, they are talking about something other than a loving, committed, same-gender marriage. So I started thinking, okay, so what kind of activity are these passages referring to and judging so negatively? Well, maybe we ought to let the Bible tell us what it's talking about. Um, you know, Leviticus chapter 18 and chapter 22 have this, um, you know, have this verse saying that it's an abomination for a male to lie with another male as with a woman. Well, what situations in the world of the Old Testament where that was written would that kind of activity occur? So I go looking all through the Old Testament for examples where you would have males lying with other males. There are two. One is it, which you probably heard about it last week. I won't rehearse the whole story for you, but the same gender activity in the Sodom and Gomorrah story is a kind of weaponized gang rape that a violent mob uses in order to chase foreign visitors out of their village and ensure that they never, ever, ever, ever come back again. That's one type of situation where you might have males lying with males in the Old Testament world. The only other one in the whole Old Testament is cultic prostitution. That same gender sexual activity crops up in these pagan worship services of the heathen tribes that surround the nation of Israel. That's it. Those are the places where you'd have males lying with other males. Well, I looked at this and said, you know, I think these condemnations are right. I have no problem at all condemning weaponized gang rape. And in fact, it fits the pattern. I found, you know, there is nothing in that kind of activity which furthers God's purposes in order to help people be 
grow into this loving gift of self. So of course the Bible is going to condemn it. Any sensible person would condemn it. Similarly, cultic prostitution as part of pagan worship services. I have no problem at all agreeing with the Bible's condemnation of those. You know, they do nothing to help us grow into the image of, of Christ. Now we're not going to have, again, Go read the book. We're not going to have time today to go through each of the passages, but the New Testament situation turns out to be similar. The same-sex activity that is publicly prominent in that world. It's violent. It's exploitative. This is the kind of thing you do to prisoners of war to establish your domination over them. Um, the Roman Empire is notorious for a sex trade where they... They capture young men in battle and castrate them and sell them on the streets. Um, they, uh, this is the kind of thing you do to your household slaves to establish your domination over them. Um, one other feature that comes in with the New Testament world is the Greek institution of pederasty, which is this weird kind of arrangement where older established men take on prepubescent boys as lovers in exchange for offering, offering them philosophical training and social sponsorship. And, you know, there's a whole aesthetic that goes along with this. The ideal, most attractive boy is one whose beard is just beginning to come in. And, you know, by the time he's 16 or 17, he's, he's too old with that, and it's considered extraordinarily shameful if the younger partner derives any pleasure at all from the exchange. And... The men who, older men who engage in this very typically have wives. It's not seen as anything, any substitute for marriage. I mean, it's just, I look at this and I go, count me in, condemning this one too. I mean, this does nothing to further God's purposes of helping us, cultivate us in a Christ-like, lifelong, whole person gift to another person. So I, I discovered as I started learning about the historical background of these eight verses, I didn't have to explain them or away or water them down at all. I could agree with every single one of them once I knew what they were actually speaking against. But them condemning things like, you know, violent gang rape had no bearing on what I found to suggest that a loving, committed, same-gender marriage could accomplish this thing God wants to accomplish, which is helping us grow into the image of Christ's self-giving love. But aren't there disqualifiers for a same-gender relationship? You know, aren't there things that rule out a same-gender relationship from, you know, from consideration as a way to fulfill these purposes God has in mind for love, gender, and uh, love, marriage, and sexuality. Well, I started looking for deal breakers. I mean, the, the, the most, one of the most obvious ones is you can't have biological procreation in a same gender relationship. So, is that a deal breaker? Does that rule it out? Um, you know, I mean, the Bible speaks about children as a gift of God and a great blessing. The Bible portrays barrenness as a tragedy sometimes, but there is no hint anywhere in the Bible or Christian tradition that if you have a couple who for some reason is not able to bear children, it would be improper for them to think about getting married to one another. It's nowhere in Christian teaching. So it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to say, well, you know, it doesn't matter at all for a, you know, an older heterosexual couple who's past the age of childbearing. You know, it doesn't make any sense at all to say you can't get married because you can't have children. How would it make sense to turn around and say the same thing to a same gender couple who can't have children? You know, the Christian tradition has never done that. Yes, children are a gift from God. Not everybody is able to have children and the church has never said, you can't get married because you can't have children. So that objection didn't hold up. Um, another one you hear about a lot are these Genesis texts in creation. You know, God creates human beings, male and female, there in the 
first part, in the image of God, he created them. Um, some people look at that, you know, it wouldn't be an outlandish reading of that passage to say, okay, you have to have both male and female together in order to have the divine image there in human life, because those ideas are associated very closely in Genesis. The only downside of that is, if you understand them that way, you wind up having to say Jesus is a defective example of the image of God, because Jesus isn't married, of course. You've just got him without his wife. Um, there is no question that the Bible portrays male and female together as the standard default pattern of human life as God creates it. I mean, we would be silly to deny that. It's right there in Genesis. But the question is, does that standard default pattern mean God would be entirely unwilling to provide blessing in situations that depart from that pattern. You know, just because, uh, just because God or Jesus in Matthew says, you know, marriage between a man and a woman is a good thing, doesn't necessarily mean different kinds of situations are terrible or bad or a sinful thing. So, I mean, the question boils down to, would it be in character for the God of the Bible? to step outside those established Genesis patterns in order to bring blessing to, different kind, to, to this different kind of relationship. Well, I started going through the biblical text, and the Bible testifies from top to bottom about how much delight God takes in doing things in ways nobody, bringing blessing in ways nobody ever expected. I mean, God is forever doing end runs around people's expectations and standard patterns in order to surprise them with this abundance of overflowing blessings. Let me give you, we could cite dozens of examples, let me give you one really powerful one. Male and female together is not the only kind of standard default pattern that gets laid down in Genesis 1 and 2. Probably even more important as a standard creation pattern for human beings is male and female, all of us living in loving obedience to God. You know, that's, that's the most important standard pattern for the human race in the whole creation as we, we continue in loving obedience to God. Well, that pattern lasts all of two chapters. And then we get to Genesis 3, and you have the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent and the garden and the tree, of the, the fruit of the tree of good and evil. And that standard pattern falls to the wayside. And the story of the whole rest of the Bible from Genesis 4 onward is the story of God bringing blessing outside of that standard pattern that was laid down in creation. So, you know, you can say God is limited to, God is only willing to bring blessing to those, those standard default patterns that are laid down in Genesis, but if you do that, you're going to have to have an awfully short Bible because you're going to need to throw out the whole thing from Genesis 4 to the last chapter of Revelation where God steps out of those, those patterns to bring blessing. So this is where, here's where I was left. God loves us, and because God loves us, God wants the best for us, and the best for us is to grow into the image of Jesus' love for us. That is God's fondest desire for each one of us. God gives us marriage as a very, not, a, not the only one, but a very, very powerful tool 
for helping us do this thing God wants us to do, helping us grow into this self-giving love that God wants us to have because God loves us. Marriage can do this for gay couples as well as straight couples. Marriage can do this thing for them that God wants to do for all of us to help us grow into the self-giving self love of Christ. The potential deal breakers that would disqualify gay couples from having God do this for them through this gift of marriage, none of them seem to stand up when I went back and looked at them. And the whole Bible gives evidence to God's willingness to step out of usual standard default patterns and expectations and bring blessing. So I've got to tell you, I put all of these pieces together, and the case just seemed overwhelming. Of course, God wants to bless same-sex couples the same way he wants to bless those of us who are heterosexual. Why would sane human beings, much less committed Christians, deprive gay people of this blessing God clearly wants to give them. The Bible speaks to it from top to bottom. That doesn't mean anything goes. That doesn't mean we endorse, you know, forms of sexual behavior that depart or that, have, that do not accomplish these purposes God has. But God wants to do this. And so I think it's time for us to set aside our mistakes, our prejudices, and embrace what the Bible actually says about this. The gospel is good news for all of us, gay and straight alike. Thank you. Okay, if you have those questions, start uh, passing them in, and we will start picking them up, and we'll make the most of the time we have left to answer. Thank you.